Welcome to POTUS 2016, where we call the presidential horse race and pour cold hard facts on the overheated campaign rhetoric. I'm Brian Lehrer. Today, House Speaker Paul Ryan's anti-poverty blueprint. It's a plan he hopes Congress and the next president will embrace. To what extent is it a smarter approach to lifting people out of poverty? To what extent is it, in the words of House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi, the Democrat, quote, the same callous trickle-down policies the GOP has been pushing for years? We will address that question in a few minutes. But first, where are we in the political steeplechase? Yes, time for the horse race. Donald Trump may be gaining some support as a result of the massacre in Orlando. The mass shooting quickly propelled national security into the spotlight, and according to the polling group Morning Consult, 29% of voters, almost 3 out of 10, now say security is their top voting issue, at least in U.S. Senate and congressional races. This is a 10 percentage point increase since early June and almost tied with economics as the top concern now. According to Morning Consult's numbers, Trump has gained in head-to-head -head polling in recent weeks thanks to undecided voters being pulled in from the sidelines, partly thanks to this. Hillary Clinton's numbers, on the other hand, have remained steady during June. However, Real Clear Politics polling averages show her maintaining a considerable lead over him. As of June 21st, Clinton, the blue line across the top, bests Trump in red, on average by about six percentage points. And judging by Real Clear Politics average trend line, the Orlando event does appear to have helped stem Trump's freefall since his racist remarks against federal judge Gonzalo Curiel, who is presiding on a Trump University fraud case. Trump the businessman, boast of his business successes, but Trump the candidate has money troubles. This past Monday, it was surprising to many to see just how little cash Trump has raised for his campaign during the month of May. In a filing made Monday, Trump's campaign reported just $1.3 million in the bank, while Hillary Clinton's coffers towered over Trump's at $42 million. Trump's tiny tally also underscored just how modest his election campaign effort is when he needs to be pushing hard in swing states. Trump currently employs about 70 staffers compared to Clinton's 700. Adding to Trump's troubles are a small group of dump Trump Republicans who believe they can wrestle the nomination from his hands next month at the convention. The likelihood of that actually happening remains slim, but the idea would be a rules change where all delegates could vote their consciences on the first ballot. But such a rule would need to be approved by a majority of those delegates, many of whom were Trump delegates in the first place. They'd vote on the floor at the convention. Wrangling so many delegates would not be an easy task when such a monumental rules change would be the clearest case yet of the establishment going against the will of voting Republicans. However, there are still a few weeks before Cleveland, and the numbers of delegates interested in hearing about such a plan have reportedly been climbing steadily. At this stage in the game, though, which may be Trump's weakest moment, the anti-Trump movement lacks a candidate, organization, and big donor backing. All right, time to dive into one policy issue, one part of the human condition that every president must grapple with, poverty. Recently, the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, revealed the outlines of a Republican anti-poverty plan that he hopes Congress and the next president will turn into law. It is the first of six blueprints that make up the GOP's better way agenda, as they call it, which will address various issues. The broad recommendations on poverty include more emphasis on work, streamlining myriad federal programs, giving states more flexibility, funding programs proven to work, and defunding those proven not to. Paul Ryan. We believe that the status quo does not have to persist. We believe that this country cannot really harness and realize the beautiful American idea that the condition of your birth does not determine the outcome of your life, we can't get that right if we don't fix this problem. Our first guest thinks the Paul Ryan anti-poverty blueprint has merit. 
He is Robert Doerr, a fellow in poverty studies at the American Enterprise Institute, the conservative think tank. Mr. Doerr was commissioner of New York City's Human Resources Administration, where he oversaw a 25 percent reduction in the city's welfare caseload and the transition to work of a half million public assistance applicants and recipients under Mayor, Mayor Michael Bloomberg. He joins us via Skype from Washington, D.C. Welcome. Thanks, Brian. It's good to be back with you. I remember some good talks on your radio show in the old days. That's right, when we were doing it for uh, the New York City uh, local audience. Now, tell us for the nation um, your understanding of the heart of the Ryan plan. Well, it's a focus on work. There's just, there is a feeling uh, in uh, the Republican conference and among Americans generally that our programs aren't doing enough to help people into employment. And Employment is really the best way out of poverty. And so there's an emphasis on greater focus on work in the food stamp program, greater focus on work in the TANF program, which has out of focus, and an attention to other programs where employment is a second priority. And I think Speaker Ryan is saying it should always be a first priority. Does that basically mean work in exchange for benefits, like the old um, welfare system before the mid-90s, didn't require work so much as the one after Clinton and Gingrich came to that agreement? Well, for people like me who've actually run these programs, it doesn't always have to have a firm uh, sanction where the failure to comply with a work requirement leads to the ending of benefits. You can reduce the benefits slightly. You can have a program that expects work. You can tell people that that's what we expect them to do and, and make it sort of part of the daily case management of the program, there are gradations to how you, you bring greater focus to work. The problem in the food stamp program is, is that for some people, and I think it's actually too many, there's no attention to work at all. And so the number of, of individuals who are receiving SNAP benefits and report no earnings, but are able-bodied, are working age adults, and could be working, has grown dramatically in the United States. And that's not a good thing. It wasn't a good thing in New York City. Um, when the program was really sold as a work support, where food stamp benefits are supplementing the wages of low-wage uh, household heads. Uh, that's a good thing. I'm, I like that idea. But I get a little worried about households where they're coming in and asking for food stamps, but they're not asking for anything else, and they say they're not working. And that family may be in distress, and we need to be talking to those families and getting them into employment. Is, is this premised on the old conservative principle of the undeserving poor? The poor are poor because they lack uh, the proper character traits rather than because the economy leaves people behind? No, I mean, that's just a cliche, Brian, and I'm kind of disappointed that you would resort to that. The fact is, is that in, in places like New York City, there are entry-level employment opportunities. They do exist. And for whatever reasons, people are not taking advantage of them but they may be in distress. The fact of the matter is, if people have earnings and they can supplement those earnings with other forms of work support, like public health insurance or food stamp benefits or earned income tax credit, they will certainly be above the poverty line. And that's better for their families, that's better for their children, and it's better for them. And I think Speaker Ryan is reacting to a concern that since, you know, welfare reform was passed in 1996, but, you know, in the more recent years, We've gotten away from that requirement or that expectation that people really need to be helped into the labor market. And, and I think that's a legitimate concern, and the numbers show it, that it's a legitimate concern. But you, I believe, supported food stamps and the earned income tax credit, for example, as the kinds of supports that would help people transitioning to work. I think you just described food stamps in that context. But Ryan's budgets over the years have been partly about reducing the amount of federal spending on poverty alleviation programs like Medicaid and food stamps and turning them into um, state level programs uh, and letting the states decide more who is actually poor and who is uh, deserving or undeserving. So does the Ryan poverty program continue that trend of how his budgets have been characterized? Well, in the, in the past, when you're the budget director or the chairman of Ways and Means and you're involved in a budget negotiation with the president and the Senate, you set a negotiating position. And that cannot necessarily, is necessarily sure where you want to end up. So holding the, the Bryan budgets out when we're talking about this poverty initiative is, I think, a little bit of a kind of bait and switch. 
He has in the past, although it was not in a, as explicitly in this most recent report, talked about greater flexibility to states provided by merging federal funding streams and providing on an experimental basis willing states the opportunity to take these large federal funding streams and use them in the way they think is best. And, you know, Brian, I ran the Medicaid program and the SNAP program and the cash welfare program and the homeless uh, program for domestic violence victims, all of which had different federal funding streams. And frankly, I think my, Mayor Bloomberg and other creative mayors would have wanted greater ability to, to merge those funding streams instead of having to always deal with these siloed programs that have different rules, different offices, different eligibility criteria. That doesn't make any sense. So often when I've heard Democrats, when they're not talking about Paul Ryan's plan, they've said that kind of thinking is a good thinking. But all of a sudden, when it comes from uh, the Speaker of the House, who represents the Republican conference, it's not a good idea. It's, it's nerve wracking. Well, it's I an think experiment. And it would allow states the opportunity to take these various funding streams and merge them and create a program that serves the person where they are, not as a recipient of Medicaid or recipient of food stamps or an EITC beneficiary. So I think the Democrats would tend to say that might be all well and good under an earnest leader like Michael Bloomberg when he was mayor of New York. That might look very different if you're talking about the governor of Alabama or Mississippi or Texas or pick your state where the or politics the, of poverty the, alleviation or, may be very, very different. And there might be uh, a popular movement to uh, leave more of the poor people behind. What about that concern? Well, so someone worried about local flexibility might also say not under such great leadership of the mayor of Detroit or Chicago. So, I, I mean, I think you're fair to say there's a concern about local leadership. That's fair. But I think the, the blue states have as much trouble with uh, necessarily getting it right as red states. And so, I, I, you know, but my view is I think you're right. That is a valid concern. And the way you handle that is you hold the states accountable. You hold the states accountable with performance measures, with potential fiscal penalties, with benefits. You offer them bonuses if they do well. Uh, in some respects, the SNAP program has a lot of state flexibility, and states are able to do certain different things. So I, I'm, I think that done right, you can have greater flexibility for states and not have this sort of uh, race to the bottom that you're concerned about. I'm concerned about it, too, and it does happen, by the way, not just in Mississippi and Alabama, but also in Chicago and Detroit. Um, there are some critiques of the Ryan anti-poverty program that also come from the right. And I'm going to cite Orrin Cass from the Manhattan Institute, who criticizes the Ryan plan for not going far enough. And he says the plan continues to rely on a federal bureaucracy that often fails. And he cites the oversight mandated. I guess that's what you were just referring to with holding states and localities accountable under this the oversight mandated in granting states more power. And he writes, quote, the problem is compounded in the overwhelming number of process-oriented recommendations. Ryan goes on to detail four proposals that entail uh, some combination of reducing duplication and redundancy. In, in other words, there is a lot of detailed federal oversight, more than some conservatives would have liked to see. I think that's true. Uh, I'm a, a Republican or conservative that does recognize that that detailed and that uh, federal oversight is here to stay. And we're going to have to recognize that. And I think to some extent, Speaker Ryan deserves credit for not putting out an idea that is a beautiful, pretty, conservative utopian, but will never happen. The fact of the matter is, if you want to move these programs in a successful and politically pragmatic way, you have to get into the details. And you have to start dealing with the world as it is not as how you might want it to be if you're Orrin Cass, who I like very much and I think writes very well on these issues, but I think he's not practical politically in his criticism. Um, you mentioned the earned income tax credit as something that you've used in conjunction with work that is a work support program. Um, and from what I've read, Speaker Ryan is not forthrightly in support of maintaining the EITC, that that's start, starting to fall out of favor in Republican circles when that was um, more of a bipartisan uh, or po more popular on a bipartisan basis because it was seen as a work support program. Now it's starting to lose favor in the GOP. Do you see, is that something you see happening? 
Well, the EITC is a long-standing bipartisan program that both Republicans and Democrats have supported. And Speaker Ryan last year said he was interested in ideas to expand it to childless adults who don't get very much from the earned income tax credit. However, the EITC and that's just so what people know what we're talking about. Earned income tax credit is, and uh, refine this definition if you want, um, for people who are um, working but not making much money, the government winds up actually supplementing their income, so they get an earned income tax credit. They can't get a tax break because they don't make enough to owe any taxes, so in effect, it's supplementing their income. Yes, and it comes at the end of the year after they file their taxes, and, it, and it's quite substantial. For a single mom with two kids, it's about $5,000 in New York City when you add in the state and city earned income tax credit. It's a very generous program, but it's probably our largest and most successful anti-poverty program. The history of it is that Speaker Ryan recognizes that. He also thought of, thought, thinks there are populations that could may possibly benefit to, with an expansion. But the problem with the earned income tax credit is it's a very serious error rate. Up to 20% of the payments that go out have been found by IRS in audit after audit to have gone inappropriately. And when you're in the, pro, in the business of running these programs, uh, you can't really deal with that with taxpayers. You can't ask for an expansion of a program like that with that big an error rate. So Speaker Ryan and other Republicans have, I think, backed off a little on this idea of expanding their income tax credit until they find a way to solve this error rate problem. And I think there'll be more discussion of that in the coming year. Here at AI, we're going to put out a paper in the next month or so about ways to address the error rate. And I think that that's going to be part of any discussion of how we expand or increase the earned income tax credit. Good. Can you stay with us while we bring on a Columbia University professor who's studied some existing poverty programs? Give us your feedback. Sure. Time for evidence-based politics, where we pour some cold, hard facts on the overheated campaign rhetoric. Fundamental to the GOP's thinking about poverty is the conviction that past anti-poverty -pro programs have failed. But have they? Joining us now, Christopher Weimer, co-director of the Center on Poverty and Social Policy at Columbia University. He and his colleagues in New York have done research that suggests poverty has dropped since the 1960s and would have been drastically higher were it not for existing programs. He's co-author of a recent working paper about historical trends in poverty. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. What question were you trying to answer with this study? So um, we've known for decades that the official measure of poverty in the United States is widely regarded to be fundamentally flawed. So um, people have known this for decades. We didn't you know, come to that conclusion or, or invent um, you know, uh, the reasons why we think that's true. But um, there have been recent efforts to improve the measurement of poverty in this country. And so in, 20, uh, in 2011, the U.S. Census Bureau and the Bureau of Labor Statistics began releasing um, what's considered an improved measure of poverty in the country. So we took a look at that um, with my colleagues at Columbia and said, well, what happens if we bring that measure back in time? Does that change our perspective on the long-term trends um, that we've seen. So, so going all yeah. the way back to, say, the beginning of President Johnson's war on poverty programs in the mid-1960s? Yeah, almost. I mean, we go back to 1967. That's the earliest data uh -huh. that we think we can compute. That's a good starting point. So, starting so point, what's yeah. the newly computed poverty rate at that time? At that time, we find it's about 26 percent. Um, so in, uh, in the official poverty universe, in, uh, under official poverty statistics, the poverty rate would have been 14, 15 percent back in 1967, which is not too different. So you think it was what, higher, almost double what the official stats had it at that time, yeah, which is exactly. pretty shameful. A quarter of the population in poverty in the United States, exactly. especially I mean, in that era, which was economic boom times. Yeah. 
And um, we, you know, we look at it a couple different ways. So it depends, the, the, the poverty line is set in a specific point in time. So in our work, we'll, when we ca calculate the poverty rate to be about 26%, we're calculating that against today's living standards. Um, you could do the same thing and calculate poverty rates over time using living standards in the 1960s. You'd see that same decline, but from maybe around 19 to 11%. So, um, so what's the poverty rate today by your calculation? About 16%. About 16%. Yeah. So what you're saying is the kind of programs like food stamps and the earned income tax credit, uh, housing vouchers, um, free meals Welcome. for kids in poverty and public schools, those are the main things that I think you looked at, yeah. that they have worked to reduce poverty by 10 percentage points. That's it, exactly. And, and the biggest problem with, from our perspective with the official poverty measure is it simply doesn't count a lot of these benefits. So the definition of resources under the official measure is just pre-tax cash income. So in the 1960s, when the poverty measure was instituted, that sort of made sense. Most of the benefits were in cash. You had the Aid to Families with Dependent Children program, known as welfare. You had Social Security benefits, unemployment insurance. Those things came in the form of cash. But they've become increasingly, um, or we've increasingly relied on tax programs and in-kind benefits in order to aid the poor. And those are, Let me get Robert Doerr's uh, comment on this. Mr. Doerr, I don't know if you've seen this study before, you're hearing this for the first time, but how much does this ring true to you? Oh, I know the study very well, and I think it's absolutely correct. And no, no one, Republican or Democrat, really denies the fact that we've made great progress in relieving the material hardship of poor Americans, and that came from actions by both Republicans and Democrats, and it included a lot of factors, including 1996 welfare reform legislation, but and the earned income tax credit, and the expansion of SNAP. So all of those have contributed to make I mean, the, the resources in households of poor Americans much stronger than they would have been without those changes. And so the official poverty measure is wrong in the extent to which it, it reflects material hardship. However, President Johnson, or anyone who really cares about this issue, isn't really interested in only helping people relieve their material hardship. We'd also like to help them be able to earn their own success so they don't have to combine work with benefits or get benefits in order to escape poverty. They can escape poverty by their own uh, efforts and by, by what's ever going on in their community. And on that score, the official poverty measure does help because it shows the extent to which so many Americans are not able to escape poverty without additional help from government programs. Does that make sense to you to add to a holistic picture? I mean, the neat thing about the supplemental poverty measure from our perspective is it allows you to decompose the trends over time. So we're able to show what would the poverty rate be without taxes and transfers and with the incorporation of resources that come from taxes and transfers. So we know from our study that without aid from these government programs, which include things like the earned income tax credit, which supplement, uh, which supplement earnings and, and to try to make work pay, if you will. Um, that poverty actually would have increased between 1967 and in this case 2012 was our, the last point when we, when we wrote this paper. Chris, I just, you'd have to acknowledge that, that that was the result of policy changes made by America, made by the country, that there was, there's not a partisan point to be made here, don't you think, Chris? The earned income tax credit, SNAP expansions, they've come from bipartisan agreements on legislation that increased uh, the way these programs uh, benefit poor Americans. Well, so it's an entire package of benefits, not just one simple law. It's not just the 1996 welfare reform, right? So the 1993 or, expansions right. of the earned income tax credit are big. The big expansions in food stamps that have happened over the past decade have really staunched some of the bleeding that would have occurred in the Great Recession. So it's not any one program, and each program has its own political history and its own series of um, you know, political decisions behind it, right? Yes, and the food stamp increases started before uh, the recession. Yep. Uh, and a lot of policy changes during the Bush administration contributed to those food stamp increases, too. Yeah, and a lot of states have done, uh, you know, particular things, easing requirements, doing less frequent, uh, you know, uh, uh, checking of income, uh, you know, relaxing. Some states have food uh, fingerprinting requirements to get SNAP, et cetera. So a lot of states have made uh, attempts to actually bring people onto the, to the roles of the SNAP program um, because I think partly that, that, that so many people are not getting, um, getting cash welfare anymore. And so right. it's a program um, and it brings benefits into the state. So when people get SNAP benefits, you know, pretty much guaranteed that people are going to spend those SNAP benefits and it's going to go back into, um, into the local economy. So, so Professor yeah. Wyman, let me ask you, how does this factor into 
any judgment that you may make about the Ryan anti-poverty blueprint, which is what the, you know, political Washington uh, establishment is going to be debating going forward. Yeah, I mean, um, as, as, as Robert said, um, uh, you know, big emphasis behind the Ryan blueprint is this emphasis on work. Um, I don't think people on, on the left or, uh, or Democrats are anti-work in any, in any, <laughs> by, any, by any means. Um, you know, I think where people have a, a hang-up or a hiccup about it is that we don't have any sort of guaranteed, um, you know, employment for people who are willing to work and able to work then, and, and maybe sending resumes out and getting those resume, no callbacks, getting those resumes denied. Um, and so if we had, you know, a, more of like a guaranteed employment or a guaranteed job of last resort, then I think people would be more comfortable with tying some of these programs to work. So if you think about the SNAP program, um, for families with kids, there's no real work requirement right now. Um, I'd be very hesitant to put a work requirement on there because it's not a work program. The SNAP program is designed to provide food assistance to low-income families. It's designed to make sure that families, especially families with kids, don't go hungry. So that's a very different benchmark. It does reduce poverty. Our work shows that it reduces poverty. Um, if you correct for the underreporting of SNAP benefits and household services, you see that it even inc increases the anti-poverty effect of SNAP benefits even more greatly. So it's a successful program. So we should be protecting it and, if anything, expanding it. Mr. Doyle, well, go ahead. Except that, except that um, employment and earnings would have a better impact or a long, more longer lasting impact on food insecurity and very low food security, which is the basic measure of hunger. So there's some ex feeling that the food stamp program hasn't done enough to help people get into employment. And the other thing I would say about a job requirement, I, I kind of agree with Chris, you have to be careful about work, uh, firm employment requirements, but what about declining an offered job? What if you offer someone a job on SNAP benefits, able-bodied adults, and they refuse to take it, even though their earnings would increase, their income would increase, their poverty situation would we're, increase? We're gonna run out of time in a few seconds, but do you see that as a big problem in the United States today? I actually know from running a welfare program in the largest city in the United States that there are people who receive benefits who would decline an offered job. We don't want kids to suffer for the sins of their parents. Um, so if you could have a wildly irresponsible parent, we still don't want that kid to go hungry. Yeah. They didn't choose where they were born. They didn't choose to whom they were and, born. And we have your, both your takes on that. We just have 15 seconds. Robert Doerr, do you think if the Ryan anti-poverty program passed the Congress that Obama and Clinton would veto it and Trump would sign it? I think uh, there is opportunity for uh, bipartisan discussion on some of these issues with, um, it, as we go forward into the future. It's all going to happen with the next president. It's not going to happen with President Obama. Um, so I'm, I continue to be hopeful that people of good faith can get together and come to good solutions. All right. Good discussion, both of you. Thank you very, very much. And that's POTUS 2016 for today. We're here each week at this hour, pouring cold hard facts on the overheated campaign rhetoric. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching.